Hey everybody, it's Jason. Welcome back to another episode of Dubious Knowledge. And this week, we are exploring... Exploring. We are talking about Zan Kuthan. Everybody's favorite... Um, pain boy? Everybody's favorite uh, Galarian Cenobite? Like... <laughs> James Jacob had a Hell, Hellraiser hard on and has decided to put Pinhead in his game. So, what's what's happening? What's going on, Corey? Not a lot. Uh, this is uh, this is my favorite evil deity in Pathfinder. So I'm I'm really excited to talk about uh, good old Zonny K. Yeah, and this week. What better what better guest to have for to, to talk about Zan Kuthan than Griffin Norman from the Hideous Laughter Podcast? What's happening, Griff? Oh, hey guys! Thanks for having me. Welcome, man. Welcome. Yeah, pleasure. I am so excited to talk about Zani K. He is uh, also my favorite uh, evil deity. I've played many a character that have been touched by his presence, if not worship him. Uh, and I think he's just like one of the most interesting core deities. Yeah, he does have a really interesting backstory. And um, I won't get too much into it. There were a couple questions when I was reading some of the literature on him that I wanted to touch base on uh, a couple of you lore hounds who are much better versed than I am. But we'll get into that in a bit. Um, yeah, Zankuthan's an interesting one. Um, there were a couple parts of it when I was reading that I I cringed at a little bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and so I I will say that I am going to put out a, a content warning for, for this episode. It's probably not going to be nearly as graphic and disturbing as the Lamash 2 episode, because that one was really tough to get through. But there are some parts where we're going to be talking about some darker subject matter, such as torture and self-mutilation um, that, you know, you might want to if, if you have some little ones listening, first of all, thank you. And you might want to <laughs> pause the episode and and have have the littles kind of scoot off the bed and come back and listen to on your earbuds or something. Yeah. yeah. So, um. Yeah, Corey. How about you? Um, how about you start us off? Let's, let's, let's get right into it because I think this one's going to yeah, go a little longer. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like uh, Jason said, we're talking about good old Zong Kuthan, uh, formerly known as Dao Bra, um, also known by the monikers the Midnight Lord, the Dark Prince, and the Prince of Pain. Um, he's the God of Shadows pain, torture, just all sorts of evil, cruel, sadistic, and masochistic things. Um, his edicts are to bring pain to the world and to mutilate your body. Um, and his anathemas are to create permanent or long-lasting sources of light and provide comfort to those who suffer. Um, areas of concern are darkness, envy, loss, and pain. Uh, he is lawful evil. Um, he does allow lawful neutral worshippers and neutral evil worshippers along with the lawful evil. Um, domains, darkness, death, destruction, pain, evil, law... Just all sorts of fun domains spread out between 1st and 2nd edition. Um, also ambition in 2nd edition because uh, a lot of his... Uh, a lot of his lore stems from jealousy. And that's how he became who he is. So ambition makes a lot of sense for, for his uh, 2e domain change. Um... His favorite weapon is a spiked chain. Um, most of his worshippers are just sadists and masochists. Um, but he also has... He's the rare deity uh, who just 
basically owns a country. Um, <laughs> the entirety of Nidal is a religious uh, theocracy uh, devoted to Zonkuthon, and whether you want to or not, you are expected to be a worshipper of good old uh, Pain Daddy. Um under penalty There's also of pain. the Shades of Uskwood, who are an albino cabal of druids that are, again, in Nidal. Um, in the forests of Nidal. Um, and then, uh, of course, that is his primary center of worship, is just the, the shadowed realm of Nidal. Um, his holy symbol is a chained skull, his holy animal is a bat... His realm is Zovikain in the Shadow Realm, um, and mm -hmm. his realm has a little bit of uh, of lore to it that we'll get to a little later. But uh, it was his prison; it now is just his home. Um, uh, that's the the basics of the uh, mechanics for him. Yeah, so. So yeah, this this is this is an interesting one where there is there are some parts like I mentioned where uh, it it it, w it was a little hard to read, um, in particular the representation of emotional darkness and debilitating loss, where that he he sort of relishes in that aspect of it. Um, Again, you know, uh, I, I've not been I have not been coy and I've been very open with my own struggles with uh, mental health. And so, again, it's a little it's 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 kind of hard, kind of hard to read the fact that, you know, you have this entity that relishes and wants to grab onto somebody who is displaying emotional darkness and going through this emotional torture and literally like manipulate them and make it worse um so if that that's the part where i was i had some i, I had a tough time um he's the ultimate edgelord god though exactly just, yeah. that's yeah. that's how you got to think of him it's yeah. like every edgy rogue worships on Kuthan because uh you know bring pain and darkness and you know zani k if he had hair it would you know cover his right eye <laughs> <laughs> right, right, uh, and and like I like I mentioned, I kind of jokingly mentioned it at the top of the top of the episode. But his physical representation is literally just Pinhead. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it is he's very, very. It gives a combo of some of the some of the Cenobites and Hellraiser with the exposed brain and everything. But yeah, his his the the flesh is pulled back and hooks. To like yeah. give him yeah. this creepy smile, he has these spikes in this like crown coming out of his head. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the things Inersi Gods mentioned is that, well, he always looks rough. No two depictions of him ever really look the same, uh, because the mutilations just vary based on who's depicting him. There will be times where he's missing an eye and has it replaced with a broken gemstone, or like Griff mentioned, the back half of his head is just missing and has exposed brain, or like you mentioned, the hooks pulling his mouth wide open into a a nasty a nasty lipless grin. Um, like, he's just yeah. Terrifying. Yeah, he's got a couple of the uh, because he he often wears like leather in these depictions, and he's got like I, I always remember the one depiction of him that has like the leather, but it's like a open center, and it's got the hooks on it, and it's just exposing his organs. Right, yeah. it's a good one. Yeah. It's pretty metal. <laughs> it, it it it. I mean, really a lot is. of metal goes into his outfit for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. again, it's just. It's told. It's totally oh. that like nineteen eighties Hellraiser BDSM sexual fetish fetishization, you know. Um, mm -hmm. 
one of the things I really liked uh, that were on this uh, the 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 topic of um, his physical appearance. They the the one part that I thought was was interesting is that they have. Like Corey, you mentioned, there's like all these different kinds of depictions because when he when he comes to Galarian, or when he shows up in in the in the Pact Worlds, um, post Gap, he never quite looks the same. But you have these these sects of worshippers that glom on to a particular aspect of him, and the priests in those sects like revere that particular like manifestation of Zankuthan to the point where they inflict those same wounds. Like if they, if he shows up with like a huge, like his two bones on his forearms exposed, they'll try to emulate that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so his worshipers try to reproduce that, that, that visage. You think that's why it changes it up so often? So that Maybe. he has varied looking worshippers. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> he's like, listen, I can't keep I can't keep these mutilations to one part of my body. Come on, we're gonna move around here, and I'm gonna, you know, this group's gonna be the one arm crew. This group's gonna be the Joker smile crew. Uh, so, like last time with Phrasma, uh one of the books I I did some reading in this this time around was uh inner sea temples um which has the uh the cathedral of e exquisite agony which <laughs> is the the high church in pengolus in the capital of nidal um and it's got like an eight page article on on this church showing exactly how it's laid out exactly what goes on there and uh like the opening room of the cathedral of exquisite agony is a piercing shop and it's the only room that is open to the public without an escort by one of the uh one of the kuthite church um, but you can go there and you can get piercings or tattoos or other forms of uh, body modification uh, done to you by a by a Kuthite priest. Um, and then the, that same Kuthite priest will also take reservations for the the cathedrals for torture rooms that they have that are specific types of torture um i think my favorite one of those was uh was a room with uh an enchanted angel statue that provides anyone who is touching it constant regeneration and then they just chain you to this statue and then mutilate you and drop acid on you and do all of these uh these cruel tortures and then you just regenerate immediately and they just keep going at it <laughs> yeah that's that's pretty similar to the actual ritual that they follow to become a member of the umbral court in Nadal which is like their kind of governing body is like you know, if you want to be a member of this, A, you got to be pretty powerful and high up and a pretty staunch worshiper of Zankuthan, but also you have to go through this grueling ritual, which is just like mental and physical, and they regenerate you the whole time so you can feel the pain the whole time. And dropping acid on you, like literal acid, not like yeah, LSD. Yeah. Not, not the fun <laughs> drug kind. They're, they're pouring acid on you. I guess dropping was a bad word, but no, they're just pouring acid on it, you it and letting you be. boil alive. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, the, uh... Jason, you wanted to talk about, uh, the joyful things. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, 
And I, 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 I specifically wanted to talk about this because uh, we had Griff on the show. And I <laughs> literally just finished um, today the evil interlude on, on Griffith's show um, where the party met up with a, a trio of joyful ones. And so afterwards, I was like, joyful ones? What the hell are joyful ones? And I had to go look it up. And yeah, so. They're terrifying. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you wanted to, if you wanted to hit us with some joyful ones. Oh, uh, man. They're like, they're highly exalted in, in the church. They're kind of, <laughs> they're people that have completely given their life to pain. And so they undergo this kind of, horrific transformation where um, their all their limbs are amputated um, and they receive blessings from Zonkathon for for doing this and they actually you know transform from a human or whatever they once were into these things called joyful things that uh, you know in like in Pangale in the church and stuff like hang from you know hooked chains and uh, kind of like, yeah. you know, they have these prehensile, disgusting tongues that can like impart negative emotions on those they touch, and they like to. And can sense fear. Yeah, yeah, they like feed on fear, um, and oh. they get like uh, they get like disgusting and flabby off of it too. So they're just like oh. these balls of like pudge with massive mouths and tongues that you know have have no ability to move on their own and basically um basically you know use the church as the way to as their means of like sustenance like bringing people in and causing fear and feeding off of it and that kind of thing so uh they're pretty gross yeah yeah yeah. in yeah in in your story like it was the way you described it was quite vivid and it was just like yeah, and, and it's like it was very fortuitous that we were talking about this <laughs> particular deity at um, right at this time when I just got through that part. So the um, yeah, it really reminded me. Um, and I was talking to Corey about this earlier. It really reminded me of um, the chubby uh, Cenobite in Hellraiser, mm-hmm. like the the really chubby one where he has like the wide gaping maw and the long tongue. And again, I get I, I I go I keep going back to Hellraiser as a small. You, you'll find that too if you if you look at like depictions of a lot of the uh, Velstrax, mm-hmm. like just the you know that these these creatures that are kind of the equivalent of Cenobites that often do follow Zonkathon, uh, a lot of them kind of look like one of the Cenobites from Hellraiser. Yeah, and so that's that was like the this, it was kind of the light bulb moment where I was just like well. When I I, used to, I just started equating anything Zankuthan to Hellraiser, and there it just kind of it all started making sense at that point. Yeah, uh, outside of uh, Griffin's show, where uh, where they got brought up, my other exposure to the joyful things is uh, the uh, the novel Night Glass, which takes place in night all and follows a a child who gets indoctrinated into the shadow callers which are uh night all's magic police force basically um and when he gets brought to the dusk call which is their magic school uh they encounter joyful ones um right in the the entrance hall and the ones in the dusk hall are basically kept in like pillars that double as like iron maidens yeah and so they're constantly getting pain from spikes and whatnot inside these pillars and then when new people are brought into the dusk hall they get released and they wrap their tongues around these new people to sense their fear and 
see whether they are worthy to be shadow callers and it's hmm. it was just such a creepy scene yeah. it really set the tone for how things were going to be at the academy there so so here's the thing too that really that really gets me is we've been talking about Zani K and his worshipers and and this this obsession with pain and darkness um, and how all of his followers whether they be monks or rogues or clerics or what have you you know they strive for pain but the thing that really interests me is that they say here in the text that even though his followers all strive for pain he himself has never explicitly said what he wants like his ultimate end game nobody knows and so like they just know he relishes pain they know he relish he relishes shadow but beyond that nobody knows what his ultimate his ultimate end game was, is like we know rovagog wants to destroy the world and destroy the universe we know Lamashtu wants to create an entire world of monsters. Zankuthan, we have no clue what nope. his end game is. <laughs> and I found that fascinating. I think and I think that's that makes him super interesting to me. Is because as a GM, you can take this deity and really use him however you want. You know? As long as you're using these themes of darkness and pain and suffering, you can hit the end game is open. I think that makes it fun to play a worshiper of Zankathon too, because mm -hmm. since nobody knows his actual goals, you can really interpret his doctrines however you want. It's like, yeah, you can incorporate pain, but you know, by that same token, in order to inflict the most pain, most of his worshippers are really adept at healing. Because they have to be. In order to keep people alive while inflicting pain. Like there there's a lot of there's a lot of aspects of him that um that you can kind of take in a different direction. Aside from really the shadow thing, because he's like the one of the few gods in the plane of shadow. Right, right. Like, got the sh first shadow from Avatar's vault god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. that's kind of in indisputable, but beyond that. Yeah, and um, I'm kind of bummed we don't have um, Heath joining us tonight. And um, Heath isn't here, so I'm going to speak on behalf of, uh, of Heath Parker from the Strange Table Fellows po podcast. Quote, fuck Zani K, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he hates him. With yeah, well, he reason. also went. He also went through signal of screams. So yeah, yeah. that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's fair. Um, the uh, so I I think with that nice segue about the first shadow grip, I, I think it's time to talk about a little bit of lore, huh? Um, because uh, that that really ties into a lot of uh. Zani K's history, but uh, mm -hmm. like, so he started as a god of art and beauty. He shared portfolios with his sister, Shellen, um, and just was a, a god of good and beauty and art and joy and they had a bit of a civil sibling rivalry and shortly after the chaining of Rovagug, uh, in which Dalbaral helped uh, to chain Rovagug by driving pillars into Galarian surface that became known as star towers that keep Rovagug pinned inside the the planet's core. Um, he got into an argument with 
Shellen and then just kind of noped out of e noped out of reality for a while. Uh, abandoned his followers, abandoned his sister, and disappeared. Um, and then he he came back and uh, wherever he had gone, something had uh something had done something to him. And he was no longer the, the god of beauty and joy, and was now a god of darkness and pain. And, uh... That caused Shellen to really start trying to redeem him, and... They went to war. She stole his glaive. Thinking that that was what had corrupted him, but it wasn't. And then Abadar decided rather than have a a war for for the god or a war between gods ravage all of reality he was going to give uh Zonkuthan a choice and that choice was you can take any one thing from the first vault where Abadar keeps the first of everything um but in exchange you have to remain imprisoned in the the shadow plane until the sun no longer shines on Galarian. And Zonkuthan took this offer, took, as Griff said, the first shadow from the the first vault. So Abadar no longer has the first shadow. It belongs to Zonkuthan. And then some some Algothus decided, hey, let's bring a giant meteor down on the planet and cause the sun to be blotted out for a good long time. And suddenly, Zani K is like, all right, I'm back. Technicality, baby. <laughs> okay, that was... Okay, so that was the um, the question I had where it wasn't clear in, in the text I was reading about his imprisonment, but you made that clear. So Aridan was the one who imprisoned him. Abadar. Uh, that's what I meant. Abadar was the one who imprisoned him. And, um, but the technicality was the... That's some Asmodeus shit right there. Yeah. That's yeah, some the, very Asmodeus There's a technicality shit. there, and then it's very unclear whether Zonkuthan actually knew that was going to happen. I think that's something that's like kind of left purposefully or vague. Or if he even is, had a role in it. Yeah, because because the the story of Nadal then is mm -hmm. intrinsically tied to Earthfall as well, and so this this thing happening that technically stopped the sun from shining, brought this god back to power, created the oldest nation in Galarian uh, mm. perhaps um, through you know his intervention and uh, and you know made him then this core deity uh, stopped a war you know but made him this core deity that is now you know the master of shadow yeah yeah that's and fascinating he, and he took that first shadow that he he one from Abadar and used it to reshape his prison within the Plane of Shadow into his deific realm. So that's what he did with the first shadow is he warped it to his own twisted desires to make his, his plane. Yeah. So um, I do want to quote this from the Inner Sea Gods text where it says where you had mentioned how um, Dal Brawl shared a portfolio with his half-sister, Shailin, um, which I thought this, this quote is really, it was really cool. And I, wanna, I just want to read it out loud here. Beauty became mutilation, love became misery, music became screams, and the art of creation became the craft of torture. Mm -hmm. And so we're, they, they really kind of take that and show us how you can take the, 
one aspect of something and really twist it into something else, which I really, which I really enjoyed. And we are joined by Mike. Finally, hey, hey everybody, <laughs> hey brother. Sorry, I was hey. uh, better late than never. Yeah, brother. no problem. Yeah, I, I took a little <laughs> trip and I got I got lost at the in the dark tapestry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> By dark tapestry, I mean the cold grips of sleep. Uh, but no, <laughs> that's a great segue. Because we were just talking about the lore, about how Dal Bra kind of just disappeared and went off to nobody knows really where. And I think that's the dark tapestry is probably a good theory. In the about... text, it just says beyond the beyond. So some event horizon bullshit. Yeah, it, it's it's strange because in Pathfinder's like written lore, this is also before all of the eldritch beings were kind of codified in the dark tapestry. And so like something that can make a god go insane, well, you, you immediately kind of think the, like the great old ones perhaps. Uh, mm-hmm. Something of that caliber, uh, but those their portfolios and stuff didn't exist for another several years. <laughs> it was, it's yeah. Leviathan. Yeah, Zon Katan was actually what the fourth deity to get an actual write up in the Adventure Path books. Um, behind Desna, Lamash to. Uh, was it, was it Abadar in book two of Crimson Throne? Uh, Crimson Throne, or was it Urgothoa? Mm. I think it, um, it was probably Abadar, because I know King yeah, Crown I, is where Urgothoa, Phrasma, and okay, all of yeah, the that old makes ones sense. get their write-ups. Um, and then, uh, Zonkadon got his write-up in book five of that. So, like, he was the fourth one to actually get a full write-up of here's everything we know about this deity. I also really I also really think it's cool that, um... So they had this sibling fight where they're quarreling and fighting and arguing and, um... It's only... It's only when Shaylin was able to wrestle away his glaive that he was like, okay, hold up. I might be dealing with somebody more than I anticipated. Like, you know, I don't want to fuck around and find out. You know, she legitimately just took my glaive from me. That's hole up. Well, then she kept it and made it her holy weapon. Exactly. Yep, yep. and he took the spike cane instead. Um, also, the the only reason she resorted to violence at all is... Zonkuthan took their father and mutilated him and turned him into his herald. Oh shit, really? I I did not know <laughs> the that. prince in chains. Oh damn. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were going to say that he was the one who who did the violence first cuz I know the he, they say called... that he would he he like stabbed her hand with his nails. Yep. And even after that, she was just trying to offer forgiveness and redemption, and then he mutilated and corrupted their father, and that's when she drew the line and resorted to violence. Um, the thing that the thing that I find fascinating is that beyond Shaylin, like Griffin said, this is the ultimate edge lord. He doesn't give a fuck about anybody else. Nope. He doesn't care about any of the other deities. Like, at all. Like, he it, doesn't. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't care about anybody. He doesn't even care about his own followers, to be quite honest. Like, his they, they, there's followers multiple pa- care about other deities. Yeah, yeah. There's multiple passages where he they, he says, I don't give a shit about my followers. Yeah. But what followers hate Desna. His followers Hardcore. hate Desna with them. <laughs> fiery pack because she yeah. represents hope within darkness and so um going back to the inner sea temples book uh there is a room in the 
cathedral of exquisite agony that is uh i can't remember the name of the room but it is essentially these are the enemies of the church room and it's the desecrated bodies of 10 desnans that had been captured and tortured and killed and they are forever trapped in the room as whites and this is a this is what happens if you're an enemy of the church room yeah they um he his followers get care a lot like they care they care about followers of Shaylin they care about followers of Desna um they do care about followers of Lamash too in fact um they they say here in the text that they'll take followers of Lamash too and and experiment on them just because uh, and... they because they are you know oftentimes like we talked about in the Lamash 2 episode they're oftentimes um how, how do I want to put this they show deformities they express def- some kind of deformity um and so the Zon- the Kuthites just will experiment on them and torture them and uh, so one but thing Zonny K himself was... He yeah. could care less about any other deity other than Shaylin. One thing that was said in, I think, Inner Sea Gods was his followers will exact very specific tortures on followers of other gods. Um, like shoving gold under the nails of Abadarians. And mm-hmm. uh, birthing moths in the eyes of Desnans, and just and, very thematic and, uh, tortures for <laughs> their poetic. deities. They're well learned. They know all the theo- theology. Um, I I, I oh, can't I can't, oh, and, I can't help I can't help but notice favorite. that you left. I yeah, can't help but favorite. you notice that dwarf daddy. Uh, you left the dwarf daddy <laughs> one for me. And yep, they yep. actually have a name for this one in the book, too. <laughs> oh, shit. I, I, I wrote a note. Now I gotta find it. Oh, where is it? I can't find it. If you find it, you can say it. But literally, I can't find the name, but what they do to followers of Torag is they will um, they will uh, basically douse their feet in molten metal to give them metal shoes and they and they actually call it oh, uh, uh, they actually named it too this this particular torture oh so they can't touch earth they can't touch earth and it's also just you know the, the whole forge father bullshit mm-hmm. I would have thought they would have just uh, made him taller <laughs> you know I can't find it elongate yet. their limbs you're no longer yeah. a dwarf I know I saw it too. I just can't remember what part of the uh, the text it was Laser in. hair removal. Take their beard away. Um, Laser hair removal is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, it specifically said that they would make them dance in molten boots, if I remember right. Yeah, I think dance was in the name. Yeah. Um, oh, here it is. Yes. Um, affixing red hot iron shoes to the feet of Torag's smith called the dance of death yeah, yeah. um the uh yeah uh so uh that that goes into the ways that the the church of Zonkuthan celebrates so let's let's talk about holidays should we yeah, before we go into get into that, I, I do want to talk about the sh- the church structure just a little bit. Okay. Um, because this is one of the, um, again, this is it's a common theme that we've gone through on. Basically, every every one of the deities except for Phrasma, Phrasma, for as much as she doesn't care about really anything, her <laughs> church is very well ordered. Um. 
Zankuthan is also is going back to that expression where his church doesn't really have a very well established hierarchy other than if you can withstand pain you are probably the high priest whoever can withstand the most pain you are the highest priest and i think this i think the only place where this differs is where griff had mentioned earlier is in nidal where there is yep. a strict order in nidal but outside of nidal um worshipers of zan kuthan tend to be very besmaran where they tend to be very underground their their uh places of worship tend to be like basements or um like barns or places where there have been um significant pain endured like um where there was kind of like mob justice and some kind of justified murder and justified torture happened um they, they these little the little pockets these little places um tend to be the, where they gather and they worship again outside of Nidal and then in the in those little pockets those little sects it tends to be the 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 person the individual who can withstand the most pain who has who has done the most self mutilation tends to be the one that leads now within night all i'll let i'll let griff i'll let, I'll let you take that hierarchy <laughs> since well uh, the hierarchy there is 10,000 years old <laughs> so the in in nadal i guess if we if we go way back uh to earthfall you know nadal was spared from earthfall by zankathan uh, and there were these kind of three most powerful leaders of the Kelid horse lords who were the um, the people of Nadal at the time um, went around to like all of these holy sites and they they came to one where Zankathan like kind of appeared like whispered to them uh, and promised them that he could save their country so they you know, seeking salvation took the deal and weren't destroyed by Earthfall and they became what's known as the Black Triune which are these three leaders that, you know, they, they like saw <laughs> visions of their tribes being obliterated by Earthfall, you know, decided to reach out to Zankuthan and they each were given visions of the Dark Tapestry uh, which, you know, twisted them into different creatures entirely than these Kellett horse lords. Um, they still rule over Nadal 10,000 years later. So Shit, really? the, <laughs> the mystery is, you know, is it the same three? Does it ever change? No one really knows for certain, but now Nadal is a Kuthite theocracy and the black triune rules over the umbral court which is this group of elites. I think there's 30 of them. I, I could be wrong there. Um, but they, uh, they basically set all the laws in Nadal. And that's why, you know, Nadal is very strictly lawful, mm -hmm. which I don't think, I don't think you were kind of giving that impression with his other churches outside no. of Nadal. Mm-hmm. But as a lawful deity, like there is very strict and regimented law in Nadal, and uh, foreigners are very, you know, frowned upon. They used to be not allowed entirely until like Cheliax uh, invaded Nadal and kind of opened their borders a little bit. But uh, it's a uh, it's a strange place. It's got. Yeah. I mean, for, for rulers to have ruled for 10,000 years, you have to be, you know, the kind of theocracy that is very punitive. And right. it is. Uh, if you could think, like, the god of pain and torture, a theocracy of that is going to be way more brutal than another theocracy. So, you know, mm -hmm. as, as you kind of see, like, the vindictive nature 
of the god is is obviously shown in like the churches and like the room with the Desnan whites and that kind of thing like the, the laws are very strict against not worshipping Zonkuthan and Ooh. the little pockets of people that don't are ousted pretty quickly yeah. I think it's like the Desnan order there is called like the order of the starless song or something and it's like the starless <laughs> night That's more, yeah it's not Starless Night. That's the ancient order. That's the uh, that's malevolence. That's, that's the malevolence yeah, that's order. Malevolence. Um, but they're they're kind of like the <laughs> they kind of do the underground railroad out of Nadal for people mm-hmm. that don't worship Zonkuthan. And, so, and that was kind of seen in the beginning of Night Glass. Yeah. Um, the the main character's mom is a a Desnan worshipper who works as one of these underground railroad type of uh, individuals to get people out of Nidal when they accidentally get caught in the Uskwood or caught in Nidal's borders and don't want to be. Um, and uh, also aligning with the 10,000 year rule thing, um, there's no age listed for him, but the high priest of the Cathedral of Exquisite Agony in Pangolis is a a vampire. So he's likely been in that position for a very long time as well. Um, High Ark uh, Chartang is his name. And, like, he... All it says is he's a, uh, a vampire... Uh, cleric of Zonkuthon, uh, level 13, according to to this book, but... The oh, vampire so. worshippers of Zonkuthon are some of the funniest characters that I think Paizo has ever written. <laughs> like, the, uh, the unquenchable guy who's, like, organs <laughs> removed so he can never... He's always hungry. There's a guy that I talked about in the evil interlude that has a, an entire, like castle set up with like wands of daylight and like he only he brings in um he brings in like the only blood he'll feed on is like of holy people because it like burns him like he'll he'll do like good clerics and that kind of thing um because it it, like hurts him to feed on them Uh, they're just like because they're vampires so it's like how does a vampire feel pain well you know in very different ways than than normal mortals <laughs> High Ark Chartain uh, has branded the text of the umbral leaves across his flesh you were going to say Mike uh, I was going to say was was the vampire uh, Makos Rorak is that the one who uh, he's, he's, a, he's a member of the he's like the protector of the triune uh, I also found out just recent, just now, that the classes of the members, uh, one is a Cavalier Sentinel of Zonkuthan, the other is a Ranger Exalted of Zonkuthan, and uh, the last is a Witch Evangelist of Zonkuthan, which is interesting being the three, you know, high-level uh, religious uh, prestige classes. And it does say they're no longer fully human, caught between a mortal life and undeath, which doesn't sound pleasurable. Well, maybe it does. Who knows? Right. <laughs> well, I mean, what sites I can talk about ZK here? Did, I, did somebody? I'm pretty sure somebody made the reference of it's like Hellraiser, right? Okay. Cool. Yes. It's, okay. Oh yeah. I'm fully gonna let the Hellraiser quote yeah, fly. Do, do it, dude. Do it. <laughs> um. Yeah. So the um. So g- good segue, Corey. Um, holy text. The holy text of Zankuthan. Let's um let's go right back to the evil holy text. And this is yet this is our we're two for two so far on evil holy texts being written on human flesh. <laughs> Lamashu was, was written on human flesh, and Zankuthan's, the umbral leaves, also written on human flesh. Um this one, however, is really fascinating because, again, the words of the god 
Um, however, what's really fascinating is that depending on which church copy you go to, the the holy text is different. The quotes are all the same, but the order that the quotes appear changes from church to church. So it's um, and also the form of the text changes from church to church. Uh, yes, some some churches uh, use flesh from the head to make the holy text, and the cover is the face. Um. Others use other pieces of the body's flesh. Um, But one thing they have in common is that while uh, they're all made of flesh, rather than inscribed with ink or um, otherwise written upon, they are carved into, and then after the leather dries, they are painted over with blood to bring out that lettering. Right. Um, Where Lamashtu's was tattooed, and then and then the skin was flayed. This one was the yeah, yeah, like you just described. Yeah. <laughs> well, part um, of the body was the bookmark. Finger, <laughs> tongue. I would imagine. Mm. Is tongue skin, or would tongue just all like I never, rot away? I never thought I'd wake up. To, yeah, that's. I, I, no. I never thought today. I guess I'd you wake can up jerky a this. tongue, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, the inner sea I, I, gods. I, I, book. I was kuthai today. I bit my tongue, and it kind of hurts. Uh, <laughs> I found pleasure. The inner sea in that. gods book leads each <laughs> chapter of each god with a quote from their holy text um and i've been forgetting to mention this in our past episodes but uh the quote for zani k is embrace misery in this world in the next forget all that is not suffering and tune your mind so that you understand the pleasures of pain And what we have to, what we also have to be explicit about is that these are not direct quotes from Zan Kuthan. Um, the, cause again, he, he really doesn't give a shit about his followers or and anybody really. Um, we get, we got, we just got to go, say this over and over again. He, he, he doesn't care. Um, the, Zan the Kuthan's quotes, a honey badger. Yeah. The quotes are actually from, a raving lunatic madman who is supposedly speaking on behalf of Zan Kuthan. <laughs> so, to be fair, everyone that he has directly touched has gone mad. True, true, very <laughs> like true. Like the Black Train and, and others. Yeah. So, um... Yeah... I had a joke, so, um, but I wasn't going to take it. I'm sorry. It's too it's too early for me to make that joke. <laughs> uh, okay. So, on, on to holidays of the church, which I'm I have been itching to talk about some of these, um, and have nice long quotes for a couple of them pulled from different texts. Um, he doesn't have a lot of holidays because. Most evil deities don't have a lot of holidays. Um, Mm -hmm. He does have a month named after him. Um, I want to say it matches up with December. Yeah, it's December. Yeah. Um, Mostly because that's the darkest month of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, So, of course, it's his month. Uh, At at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. and so there are a couple of things that are are associated with holidays for him that aren't actually holidays. Um, and those are uh, the joy making, which we kind of talked about a little earlier, um, which is how you become a joyful thing. Um, 
and that is when you get uh, high enough in seniority and influence within Night All to request this service uh, so that you can be closer to your deity. Um, and the Church of Exquisite Agony actually has an altar that is dedicated to the art of joy making. Um, the altar is in the, the shape of a stainless steel skull with chains coming out of the eyes just like Zonkathon's holy symbol. But in the eyes are just gaping holes into which the severed body parts of the the new joyful things fall um so uh the the quote i have for the joy making is from the opening passage leading into the exquisite to the or the cathedral of exquisite agony's article uh joy making that doesn't sound too bad i said nervously to the kuthite priest accompanying me the choir began chanting in an unknown language as four priests carried a man onto the altar and attached chains to the body. The chant reached its climax, peaking on a powerful note before ending abruptly. The priest's curved blades fell upon the chained man's arms and legs in perfect unison and with surgical precision and his severed limbs dropped into the hollow eye sockets of the great silver skull. His loud scream lasted only a few heartbeats before he passed out, but it felt like an eternity. Lieutenant Vectris, Chelish Attaché. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, and, like, so, the first thing that's done is all of your limbs are severed, but then they also start going in and removing non-vital organs, um removing lips, eyelids, uh, just all sorts of, uh, things to make you constantly feel pain. Let's also, let's also not forget that, um, the very last sentence here in Inner Sea Gods for this section says, and I quote, Often the removed pieces are eaten by the others present in the hopes of gaining an echo of the joyful thing's luck and sensation. And that's true most places you make a joyful thing, but not at the Cathedral of Exquisite Agony, where instead, like I said, these, these limbs fall into these dark pits, and what lives in these dark pits are uh, things called, um, oh, what is it? Um, joy, joy made necrocrafts, which are constructs made from the severed limbs of the joyful things. And Yummy. The ones that live down there will consistently take the new limbs that fall in and start trying to graft them onto each other to make themselves stronger. Well, um, Mike, Griffin discussed joyful things earlier. Did you have thoughts on the joyful things? <laughs> um, I mean, they're just so cool. They're, they're a f if you know about Hellraiser, and I'm going to talk about Hellraiser a lot because that's the closest thing we have in our, you know, thinking to anything. In our pop culture, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, the making of a joyful thing is very similar to how they make someone a Cenobite through experiencing the pleasure of pain. Uh, sure, it's a lot more limb removing uh, and not replacing, but it's, um, uh, I, I don't want to say anything, so, but uh, joyful things will, in my game, are going to make an appearance quite soon uh, because I like making weird voices and making my players feel uncomfortable by saying strange and odd things to them. But uh, I think the, it's just so wild, the Kuthite religion, because you're right. Zankuthan doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care. All he wants is his stick back. But, he, you know, 
his all of his worshippers are like, "Let's cut our arms off. Let's pull our intestines out." This dude's a vampire, and he's like, "I don't ever want to not have my thirst sated because I love <laughs> suffering so much." Well, it's just like I'm gonna have sun rods everywhere in my house. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. It's literally <laughs> like the joke of any vampire movie is that how that is how his people live through constant pain and constant agony. They find. Uh, a oneness with their deity and I mean uh, as far as evil gods go Zankuthan is probably one of the more more popular I would assume oh yeah yeah <laughs> so for 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 player characters mm-hmm. I should say you know evil yeah. evil written characters it's like Urgothoa let's go and you know Lamash too Lamash too has a whole I don't want to say ancestry anymore because it's not going but she has credit for creating two basically you know Zankuthan only made one thing but yeah, the um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's just like <laughs> he just doesn't care. I mean, he 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 cares just a minuscule amount enough where he will bestow his clerics with their spells. Like so, he he cares just a just a little bit enough that he can, he will say like. Okay, this cleric is praying to me to get you know harm. Sure, take take harm for the day. See, I don't think that's. But that's about it. That's about it. I don't think that's a that's a, a, a conscious thing for deities. I think that's just a byproduct of divinity. If somebody worships you, you get they get a a divertment of abilities and powers just from it. You know what I mean? Sort of like being in the light. Of, I mean, the deity can make the conscious decision to cut them off. Sure. Um, yeah, but maybe so, maybe, I mean, maybe it's yeah. just kind of automatic, and they have to actively mm-hmm. choose to cut them off. Otherwise, it's automatic. Maybe yeah. I don't know. I, mean, uh, I haven't touched the starstone yet. I haven't gotten blackout drunk yet to touch the starstone, so I don't know. <laughs> Gotta reset the block. Uh, his spells hit the firewall. Just... The uh, the other uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about in holidays before talking about the one actual holiday there is some of the other um, religious celebrations that occur when holidays happen. Um, And those are known as the Great Tortures. Um, And there are several of them, but the the one that got the most description in Night Glass is the, the Great Torture known as the Needled Choir. And I'm going to read you a passage from Night Glass by Leanne Merciel. Um, The Needled Choir, like most great tortures, is a performance piece. It was not meant to wring information from its victim, nor was its primary purpose to inflict pain. It was rather meant as a spectacle to delight and intrigue an audience and was most often conducted in Zonkuthan's cathedrals during the celebration of his High Holy Days. For the Needled Choir, bound victims are laid on tables, arrayed like the spokes of a wheel, with their heads pointed inward and their feet radiating outward. There might be as few as three, or as many as twelve. Uh, Chelarel of Nisroch, who was infamous for her excesses, once had conducted a choir of 48 arranged in two concentric rings. And what this this great torture is is they take these thin needles these thin hollow needles that have a little uh, ribbon attached to them, a blood red ribbon. And they shove these needles. Uh, content warning: This is this is very graphic. If you don't want to listen to this part, uh, tune out for about the next minute and then come back. Um, but they shove the needles into a person's windpipe and have to aim it just precisely enough so that it doesn't, you know, hit the jugular artery or go all the way through the windpipe and cause them to never be able to breathe again. You just have to puncture the windpipe and then the air escaping out of the windpipe 
will cause a singing sensation that will make the the blood ribbon dance. Yeah, musical tracheotomy. Like a pipe organ? Like a like a <laughs> That's it's so like good. it's like if you were blowing into a reed, but you didn't have to use your mm-hmm. lips anymore. <laughs> it's an ocarina of pain. Yeah. Uh, and like uh. the one in the book gets botched, and it gets botched badly. And oh, I remember that. Yeah. It, it's so graphic and disturbing, and I'm just like, oh, this is this is horrifying. I need to talk about it. I really have to read these novels. This is the one thing in Pathfinder lore I do not read. I haven't read are the are all the Pathfinder Chronicles, the novels. I've read all the core books and the splat books and all that. Just I don't now I gotta read that one about Zankuthan and the missing windpipe. I guess is what the Scooby Doo episode would be called. <laughs> it's actually what it's called. <laughs> Zankuthan and, <laughs> and the choir of windpipes. Um uh. And then the actual only holiday that was listed is known as the Eternal Kiss. Um, it happens on the first new moon of the year. So uh, the one that would be in the equivalent of our January. I, who gets January? Is it Avatar? I, I don't remember. <laughs> January um, is Abadeus, yeah. Abadeus. Ha ha! Abadeus, uh, so Abadeus. The first new moon in Abadeus, which makes sense since one of the few gods that Zani K has a beef with is Abadar. Um, but it is an 11 day sacrifice of just constant torture. Um, and it involves using the victim's entrails or cries of pain as soothsaying tools. Just. Wonderful God, that Zonny K. His yeah, holy days are well for exquisite. That. <laughs> well, you, you didn't, which is I think the the standard thing everyone says about Pathfinder is you didn't read the the last line, uh, <laughs> which isn't technically the last line, but the victim of this is kept alive and pampered and pleasured for ten days. Yeah, and on the eleventh uh, day is when all the problems happen, and. <laughs> The sacrifice is said to speak in the voice of Zankuthan himself at the end. The, those are the, the holidays of Zankuthan. Um, we do have a few aphorisms, uh, like all the gods have. Um, the first being, abandon your tears. Um, and this one is basically, Kuthite's view tears as a source of weakness um they are taught to endure pain without crying without showing that they are in pain um they are taught that pain is pleasure so to shed tears is to show weakness and to show unworthiness um so that is one of the aphorisms of of the cult um experience without limits uh this one is one of the aphorisms that has a dual meaning uh the first is that kuthites strive to to seek sensation beyond the limits of mortal limitations you know going back to becoming a joyful thing being one of the highest honors of the church um that is most definitely experiencing sensation beyond mortal limits um and then the other meaning of it is that uh Kuthites shouldn't let the limits of society dictate their worship because most society is frown upon you know torturing people and flaying people and uh, self-flagellation and all of the things that Zani K worshippers tend to do. Um, uh, Never a rusty blade is an aphorism that describes the importance of good tools. 
Um, because if your blade is rusty when you go to torture somebody, the torture is not going to last as long because a rusty blade's going to cause infection and sickness and they're gonna just die on you. So you want a nice clean blade, well kept, well maintained, so that you can just elongate this torture as long as you possibly can. Um, and then the final one is grasp the chain. And uh, that one is really a description of finding the power in embracing pain. Um, you know, Zankuthan is known as a god of pain and a god of darkness, but it's not pain that is unwillingly inflicted on his worshippers. It's pain that they happily seek out for themselves. And so that's what that aphorism is tied to. No, I think it's funny that, you know, we've talked earlier about how all of his portfolio is meant to parallel, like, and, and be a foil to Shaylin now. But if you worship him in the correct way, it's almost exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Like, if you interpret it in the way, like, these aphorisms are telling you to interpret it, it's the same portfolio. Demons to some, angels to others. <laughs> yeah. I just want to let you guys know, I stayed up go. and watched almost every Hellraiser movie and, uh, uh, not Pitch Black, <laughs> uh, the other one, in space. Event Horizon. Yes, Event Horizon, because I don't know why, I just wanted to, and I have, uh, I had, of course, this isn't a visual media, but I'm... I forget that all the time. For every aphorism, I had a Hellraiser quote that was just like it. And it's one of the things I, I was literally in my notes writing stuff down, thinking like, okay, this works, this works, this works. And it pretty much is like a homage to Hellraiser, which is probably why Zani K is one of my favorite gods, because I love that series so much. Uh, I, I mentioned it to Jason earlier, but uh, despite the fact that Zonkathon is one of my favorite deities in Galarian um, and is my favorite evil deity uh, I have actually never seen Hellraiser how <laughs> and I was I was, say, I was I was saying earlier that the original if you e even if you if you can get you got you, you got to put your blinders on and get past the orientalism of the the puzzle box because that's just 80s yeah backwards yeah. stuff um it's slow the original is really a really slow movie but it's good but the one from 2022 oh it's was, the best was really good it's the closest was thing to the really books. freaking good it's the closest yeah. thing to like the way the books actually are yeah. and also it's called the lament configuration yeah. jason just to let you know <laughs> um, I, I know but the, but everybody but, knows I, that I, it's the puzzle my, box i i I think after this conversation, yeah. I'm True actually going to go watch yeah. those two. Uh, just and you should you, the the really cool thing about the 2022 one t is um, the main Cenobite, the Hell Priest, was uh, the uh, the actor that plays it is a trans actor, mm -hmm. and she did a phenomenal job. Oh, just abs. She like she's probably the she was the best, in my opinion. Um. Yeah, for sure. Um, she did Doug Bradley. I Crowd. do want to say that quick go for over sure. yeah. the Starfinder stuff. I, I pulled it up here because, again, Heath wasn't here. Um, unfortunately, they they were recording tonight. They they had they had some. Tonight's their backup recording night, and they had they had to reschedule. So, um, he's still around. He's he Zani K is still one of the core Starfinder deities. Um, after the gap, still lawful good, the god of darkness, envy, loss, and pain. So again, same portfolio. Centers of worship for Zankuthan are Akaton, Apaste, the Diaspora, Eox, and Verses. Makes sense. Same holy symbol, skull with a spike chain through its eye sockets. 
Um, the they upgraded the weapon this time. It's it's no longer a spike chain. It is now a shadow chain. And so I looked up a shadow chain. Um, it is basically a spike chain, but it does cold damage. So the, the their cryo weapon that generates super cold uh, gas, and they can damage an incapacitated target. So they this is a analog reach disarm trip weapon that does cold damage. Um, yeah, so he's still, still kind of still there. His edicts are to bring pain to the universe, bring darkness to where there's light and seek new expressions of agony. Anathemas to create permanent sources of light and allow a subject a quick death and prevent comfort to those who suffer. Again, same, basically the same exact Almost the anathema. same exact edicts and anathemas. Exactly. It's like he hasn't changed. Yeah. yeah he, at again, all. <laughs> again, again, I don't think he cares enough to change. He just upgraded uh, his weapon. <laughs> uh, pain doesn't change though. Darkness. Pain through the gap. Yeah, pain, yeah. pain is pain is one thing that's consistent. You know what I mean? So it would be you know. <laughs> um, so the, that's that's the all, that's all thing... I, that's all I got for uh, post-gap stuff. The last thing we have I have one is, thing that I thought I... Uh, his uh, his planar allies. Yes. And uh, much like much like uh, Phrasma last time, he is one of those uh, deities that does have an entire uh an entire planar ancestry, essentially, that is his. Um, and that would be the Velstrax, which Griff mentioned earlier. Um, and Velstrax, formerly known as Chitons, um, also known as Chain Devils, uh, they are, as has been said many times, very much essentially just Cenobites from Hellraiser. Um, each of them looks a little bit differently, but they all look gruesome. <laughs> um, they're, and like they have, like demons and devils, they also have demigods of their ilk um, called uh, Chitin Demagogues. I think. Yep. Um, and the one that we have an image for of the Chitin demigods is, uh, oh, she's essentially the, the face from that one Doctor Who episode, the moisturize me. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, the, the last human. Moisturize me face. The last human in existence. Yeah, the yeah. last human. Yeah. Um. And that's the picture we have is just this stretched out face on a on a rack. Um, a little bit more gruesome than the Doctor Who version, um, but makes sense. Yeah, uh, and then uh, he does have some specific, unique servants. Um, again, Griff talked about one of them earlier, and that's uh, Dominic the Unquenchable. Uh, the vampire that uh, has eternal thirst because he uh, doesn't have digestion organs anymore. So, <laughs> whoops. Um, the Umbral Shepherds, which are strange otherworldly servants uh, devoted to Zongkuthan who possess, uh, use their powers to possess creatures and further the agendas of their masters. Uh, Vreet Hall, who is a specific Velstrak who's covered in wounds that he inf or that it inflicts upon itself, in which transform into other organs, each performing their normal function. Um, Nihil the Ashbringer, who is an Ashmead who was given to the dragon Kazavon to serve as an assassin. I uh, you could probably mention Kazavon himself as one of Zonkuthan's biggest allies, uh, but that's more for spoiler corner. We'll get to there in a minute. 
Um, and then, uh, last but not least, is the Prince and Chains, uh, yeah, who we also talked was... about earlier. And yeah, that's... that was one I wanted to pick your pick you guys' brain on, because you you had mentioned you had mentioned that bit of lore, and that blew my mind. I had no idea. Yeah, uh, he is the the corrupted remnants of Thrawn, who was the shared father of Shaylin and Zong or er, Dalbral. Um, oh, so not the not the uh, the Chiss heir to the Empire. Admiral of the Imperial <laughs> Navy? No. <laughs> Not and, that far? Uh, <laughs> nice. It's this guy right here. Uh, because nice. apparently, uh, apparently, Shaylin and Dabral were born from a wolf. A primal wolf spirit. Daddy? Is, I think, the way. Um, like Romulus and Remus. To. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, prince that howls. Yes. Um, and, uh,. The little, uh, the little block of lore that we get underneath the tech, er, underneath the stat block is Zonkuthan has stripped the flesh from this spirit wolf and replaced it with haphazard layers of metal, leather, and necrotic tissue to create a terrifying herald. The hmm. prince in chain stands 18 feet tall and weighs nearly Jesus. three tons. Jesus, 18 feet tall? He's just and three he's tons. A primal spirit wolf. Of course, he's going to be eighteen feet tall and weigh three tons. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's all the extra weight from the leather and metal <laughs> and the yeah. chains. <laughs> yeah, I think the chains add the weight there. Not the spirit not itself the spirit. is not that heavy. It's the <laughs> it's the attaché. I, I, I love the I love the play on the name because Thrawn was originally known as the Prince that Howls, and now he's the Prince in Chains, and it's sort of like the ultimate fu. I don't know why I didn't just cuss, but I felt like it was needed to say it that way. Uh, it's the ultimate, like, thumbs down to your sister who's super pretty and beautiful and loves all things. Like, yeah, well, dad loves me more. <laughs> I've mentioned this before, but if you're, if you're, this is the first episode you're listening to, um, you know that um, I'm a history nerd and one of my undergrad degrees is in history and particularly the history of the Catholic Church. So one of the things that stuck out to me when I was reading this was the mention of Lampadarius, which I ended up looking that up. And the Lampadarius was a type of chitin in first edition Pathfinder. But the reason that struck a nerve or not struck a nerve, the reason that struck a light bulb for me is that Lampadarius is a position in um, the Catholic Church. They are the ones that uh, carry the candles and the lamps uh, before the clergy comes through. So during Catholic celebrations, before like the bishops and the cardinals, you generally have lower level priests. Or if you're in a particular smaller church, it's generally like altar boys um, that would carry the candles. They are the Lampadarius. And so that really kind of popped out to me that that they use that term. When I looked up the when I looked up the chitin, it has absolutely nothing to do with that. So I was trying to put two and two together, and I just think they just thought it was a cool word. I, I, I think there's there's I think no they all mirrors. I mean, they don't mirror what what they do, but I mean, if I go down the list, I think a lot of these are from the Catholic Church. It's like yeah, it apostle, augur, cantor, yeah. evangelist, uh, libertinari, mm-hmm. yeah, sacristan. Like they're, I think they they drew almost all of them from <laughs> either positions or, yeah, yeah. I was just like when I looked at the stat block, I was like well, thinking of they're like the opposite candles and fire and some kind of like procession or something. And there's like maybe there's like an ability or something. I was like, no. <laughs> maybe they're, they're CR level four. Well, maybe it's just because they're a low CR, and they're the well, first. I think it's a play on words. If if they what they do is they take parts of their body and replace it with shadow stuff. It's the opposite. It brings light. To, uh, yeah, they use darkness to light their way with shadow. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's a reverse oh. of being a light bearer. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. Gotcha. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I was coming to that same conclusion, Mike. It, mm -hmm. they, they are the opposite of a Lightbringer because they replace parts with shadow and bring darkness instead. Oh, good point. Very cool point. And they have to maintain balance or they become shadow creatures as opposed to Lampadarius. They lose their ball strack uh, subtype trait, I guess would be the best way to put it because we're all 2A now, trait, and they go into the shadow. They become a shadow creature as opposed to being a creature of flesh and shadow. Very cool. Nice. What today I learned. Awesome. <laughs> well, before we go into spoiler corner, is there anything we missed? Mike, there's, was there anything you want to touch on? You joined us uh, a little bit late. Was there anything you want to touch on? Uh, the, the interesting thing, because going back to Starfinder Corner, because I knew Heath wasn't going to be here, I did a little bit of Starfinder research. Uh, there is a stronghold for Zonkuthan in orbit where Galarian used to be. Really? Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a, a citadel. I guess it would be considered like a citadel. Or, or huh. what, I, I guess. I wonder if that... Now it makes me wonder if the the Black Triune survived, and the, and they are in that set at all. Maybe. I mean, kind of gives GMs a little bit of like a the fun. Are back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Other than that, I'm just all right. I'm and happy I woke up. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything you want to touch on on Zani K before we go into spoiler corner? All right. Well, um, so we're going to go into spoiler corner. I think we want, there's a couple of Pathfinder APs we want to touch on, and we'll probably talk about Signal of Screams a little bit, um, which is a Starfinder AP. Mm -hmm. what, what Pathfinder APs do we want to touch on? Just want to give the heads up to the listeners. Uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne is the big one. Okay. Anything else? I don't know if this would be uh, for Carrion Crown, but uh, I do believe it, it's more, I guess, it would be more of a spoiler for HLP. So uh, yeah. the Shades yeah. of the Uskwood okay. would be something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you so, yeah, well, the evil interlude. Uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be <laughs> spoilering uh, Griffin's podcast and, um, well, Griffin's other podcast, which <laughs> yeah, Corey. <laughs> Which Corey and I both GM'd uh, all the way through as well. So, um, but before we get into those, um, let's quick do a round table and do some outros. Um, Corey, hit us yeah. up. I uh, you can find me on the internet uh, most places at Corey Marie Twenty One. Um, you can find my writing at three-time Eisner award-winning women write about comics, also comics beat. Um, the And if you want to enjoy me as a, a tabletop personality, uh, I am on the Drunken Geeks True Crit RPG as Gripply Inventor Tapool. Um, I am also on 50 North as the immaculate J or G Wow, uh, and uh, my voice can be heard as uh, Besmara in the opening uh, cold opens for Twenty Five North. Awesome, uh, Mike. Uh, hey everybody, it's it's me, Mike, the sleepy boy. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on all the discords. Uh, you know, Buster Knuckle. Uh, I, you can find me on Fifty North too because that's one thing I forgot about last time we got together uh as the lovable old corruptive uh goblin rum grum uh you, i'm also the voice of lupus gallo on 25 north and uh yeah i'm not on any other streams or shows and meanwhile my spirit wolf is chewing on my arm wanting to get my attention don't turn on your prints and chains yeah no <laughs> no all right griffin uh where can we find you sure what are yeah, you up to I, i'm Griff, I uh, am the GM of most of the shows on the on Hideous Laughter Productions a podcast network. We do uh, the Hideous Laughter podcast, which is currently a first edition Carrying Crown podcast. Almost finished our sixth book, and will become a um, Skull and Shackles second edition podcast, which I will also be GMing. 
I also GM the Bestow Curse podcast, which is a converted to second edition uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne podcast. And then I uh, get to play a little bit on our Patreon as a plant person on Speak with Plants, which is a second edition converted Iron Fang Invasion AP. Uh, so you can find me at uh, at GM Hideous on um, on most social media, but you can find the podcast at at Hideous Laughter Pod or at Laughter Hideous, uh, depending on the depending on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or you can just go to the hideous laughter podcast.com. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. If you, um, and you all know me, um, I'm your GM, Jason. Um, so yeah, check out, um, if you want another, if you want some more pirates in your, in your ear holes, um, you can listen to skulls and shackles after you, if you, after 25 North. So like we talked about in, in Griffin's zone of truth show, um, or Steve's zone of truth show. HLPs is on a truth <laughs> show. Um, if uh, to- if uh, the Twenty Five North podcast is the Muppets Treasure Island, um, Skulls and Shackles is much more your serious pirate show. So it's going to be a good time, man. And we'll I'm see. Excited. We haven't recorded any of it yet. Apparently, <laughs> <Very true. laughs> turn into Muppets Treasure Island. <laughs> it might be the Muppet uh, show. <laughs> it's gonna have Chris. Yeah, he's a Muppet, so. <laughs> <laughs> How's he know? So, yeah, um, all right, spoiler corner. So, uh, what do you got? You got a box there. Yeah, this is a box. You got a it's, D6. It's, yeah, it's a it's a big old puzzle box D6. I can't find my lament configuration. Some that's somewhere around here in my office. So I opted for the next biggest uh, puzzle box that I can find, and uh, this is it. Nice. As big a cube as is nearby. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, it's the it's the so. D six of death. Whenever I need to roll a, a a single D six, which is never because you know five book five of an AP, you don't ever roll a single D six. Well, you roll it when you're choosing between six players. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Generally, I just go for that's error. A good call. Uh, so let's uh, quick get um, st- the Starfinder AP out of the way. Yeah. Uh, signal of screams. So this was a, a Starfinder AP, and if you want to listen to a good run of it, um, I don't know if any other of the Starfinder shows have done it yet, but um, Heath, you can you can listen to Heath play through it as Adam GM's, GM'd them through Signal of Screams. Um, it's, it's a wild one, man. Um, it's very this, dark. Very, yes. very dark. Which, of course it is, because it's all about the Shadow Plane and Zonkathon. <laughs> yeah, so so this one really, like I had mentioned, or I don't know if it was on if it was on recording, or if we did this off of off of recording when we were, we were talking to Sir Vertigo, um, Steve. Um, this this one leaned heavily more into like shadow and darkness, much more than like fear and torture. At least that's the way I felt. Now I wasn't a player; I was only a listener. So Heath might have had might have had a different experience. But as a listener, it felt like the story, or maybe it was just the way Adam told it. There were a couple. There were a couple torture scenes, but it felt like so, the theme of the show was much more shadow. Shadow. shadow I think a shadow. lot of what that adventure is trying to convey is the like. The corruption thing is a huge piece of it. Yes. And, and you know, if, if listening to all we've said about Zani K uh, has struck a chord with anyone, it's that, you know, every everything he touches gets corrupted in that kind of awful, unbelievable, insane way. Um, so I think that was, you know, that's a big theme of Signal of Screams that they is the first time they touch it at all in Starfinder. You know, it was the corruptions and that kind of thing were introduced in first edition, but they, you know, they only really play with it in that AP, I think for good reason, because it's supposed to delve into, you know, Zonkathon and that kind of thing. Um, and that's a good place for it. Yeah. Right. And, and like yeah, you and... said, Adam did a fantastic job of, uh, of really, uh, 
straddling that line between over the top and just enough. Right. Um, I think, and I think too is, um, and Adams talked about this himself in their behind the scenes show is that his player group is not a horror group. Like none of his players are into horror movies at all. So I think that was that was a big part of it too, where he wanted to, and that, I mean that's your that's your job as a GM is you you need to direct it you direct the adventure for your players, mm-hmm. um, you need to know your audience so to speak, and so I think he was able to pull back just enough, to your point, Corey, to pull back just enough where you you, you keep you you, you keep just. A little bit to get the, to keep that flavor, but pull it back enough to allow the players to at least enjoy the adventure without overwhelming them. Yeah, I think you could certainly take that adventure path darker with another player group. I think Absolutely. that's kind of where it's meant to go. Mm-hmm. It may not have been, you know, I think, you know, knowing the STF crew, <laughs> it was the next. Uh, level group of adventure and the only one at that level range available at the time so they played it i don't know that it was the best pick uh given the players but um but yeah i mean you certainly have to tailor that adventure to any group with uh, session zero because it's uh it's Mm -hmm. there's gruesome parts of it there's gruesome parts of it that can be taken to you know a level that is Really gruesome for a group that enjoys that, um, but for a group that <laughs> doesn't, you know, you really want to pull back like Adam did, um, because the horror elements are certainly there in that AP. Yeah, it can get uncomfortable really fast for the wrong group, and so a yeah. testament to a great GM is being able to tailor that to the group as needed. So, kudos, Adam. Always kudos. That's thank. That's exactly what I was going to say too, Corey. I'm like, it's also a, a, a shine on Adam for being able to do horror well, and Griff, you as well. I mean, you you handle the horror and the the dark with just enough right and left. I guess would be the best way to put it. Right brain, left brain is the way I describe it, because like horror is very easy to go too far and it be martyrs as opposed to being nightmare on street you know what i mean so like there's there's right you know, there's certain there's certainly a level of doing horror at a at a table with a group mm-hmm. that loves horror and doing horror for like you know a show like like adam and i do for people of varying levels of enjoyment like, <laughs> of that and you know you you certainly have to pull back in in ways that make it listenable which is why, like, you know, we always put, like, the content tags on, like, our evil interludes and that kind of thing because it it veers on the side of, like, the stuff we've talked about with, with Zonkathon where it's like, okay, this is very gruesome. Um, and for for a medium like that, you, you probably want to err on the side of... Yeah. The side of more fun than horror, if I'm being honest. Oh, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, to your point, Mike, you can definitely take it to martyrs or, you know, um, high tension. You know, one of those. Yeah. The, what, the, the, I literally went the furthest I could li- think of like, that, mo- that somebody could have seen that film. I could have mentioned some random one-off uh, horror movie just that like, only it. I've seen. A Gaspar Noe movie. Just, just Yeah, yeah, exactly. French versus, you know, horror. Army yeah. of Darkness. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also a trick in, hu- in horror. You could also you could take a real serious horror game and then just for a little bit flip it to silly just to give your players that exhale. You know what I mean? Like horror isn't Ar- an army of darkness adventure would be fun though. Yeah. <laughs> uh Oh, you mean like uh, you mean like trees that enjoy yeah. the taste of oh, uh, yeah of piss. Yeah, I mean, it's beyond I mean, the scope of Zonkathon's anathema. I was gonna say, or have like a water, <laughs> a, a, a water gun fight, 
against vampires, <laughs> and the water just happens to be holy water. Something like that, you know? When you have someone in your group that can make things out of nothing, and they say, can I make a, a water gun? And you figure, like, I guess so. And next thing you know, they're super soaker vampires. That'd be pretty with, easy for you to do. Yeah, you super soaker vampires holy with holy water. That's what you do. You you monster squat it. Yeah. That was, a uh, wasn't that in, um... Oh, Jesus, now what? I'm now I'm blanking on the name. With Kiefer Sutherland and... Uh, Lost Boys? Yeah, Lost Boys. I don't think mm-hmm. they... Did they have... What? The Frog Brothers. Yeah, the Frog oh, Brothers. Oh, yeah, the Frog Brothers. Yeah. All right. Anyway. All right. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, so, yeah, Signal of Screams is um, the big one for Starfinder. Um, I don't know if there's any other Starfinder adventures that really touch on Zonkuthan at all. Um but there are so. there are a few there are a few uh, Pathfinder because Pathfinder's been around for a lot longer. Um, I think the big one, like we mentioned, was Curse of the Crimson Throne. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zon influence is all over that AP, but it doesn't become super apparent until Book Three. Um, he, Which, if you're if you're an HLP cast member, just stop, stop listening. Listening, tune out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you you start to get it with uh, Salvatore Scream and mm-hmm. the you know these kind of mysterious paintings that he starts doing that are you know tied to the resurgence of Kazavon, and then you start to learn. Well, then you meet. Like everyone's favorite NPC, mm-hmm. uh, God, who I is can't a wait to <laughs> who is a Cuthite. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, she, I'm curious as to see how you're going to play that one up. She, she is was, the uh, opposite of your your standard Cuthite, and I I, I love yeah, her. She's, yeah, she's she plays very very heavily against type. She was uh, <laughs> she was Buffy. She was basically Buffy in my game. Yeah, I I, I played uh, her as Buffy. Uh, I have, I have gotten uh, our wonderful Discord uh, user Ellie to record a couple of songs to use for Leori for my games, um, including a an ode to pain, which is rewritten ode to joy, uh, but in minor key instead of major key. Uh, or at least that's what it would be in the actual church, but Leori's going to sing it in major key because that's what she is. She's happy cheerleader of Zong Kwan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, uh, when I introduce her, I'm planning to have her using her uh, spike chain as a jump rope. Uh, so Ellie has recorded a, a Zong Kuthan esque uh, jump rope song for her to be singing as she is jumping rope into into my adventure. You just you just uh, do a parody of one two Freddy's coming for you. Yeah. If I remember right, that's what she did. I think that is the tune she did that too when yeah. you shared yeah. it with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have you have Laori uh, obviously in in book three, who um, you know comes to the party looking for scream um they realize his importance they realize her ties to zonkathon um and you know that starts kind of the evolution towards what is you know one of the greatest dungeons in in pathfinder first edition period which is scarwall um, mm-hmm. which is one of the aforementioned, like a castle built around one of the aforementioned star towers yep. mm-hmm. um, that Dobrow, you know, plunged into the earth to keep Rovagug there. Um, and that's where you, it was formerly Kazavan's home. You know, Kazavan is, in essence, the BBEG, um, mm-hmm. in spirit, uh, and you know, you're, you've learned his story through Scarwall, you know, learn about this ancient blue dragon worshiper of Zankuthan, basically. 
uh, and find the weapon to defeat him. Yeah. Uh, did you mention the other, the other Kuthite NPC? Uh, Shadow Count Sial, um, who is the the yin to Laori's yang. He is your traditional Kuthite, very mm. gruff and serious, and all about no nonsense pain. Um, and he has a. He has a Velstrak Eidolon. He's a summoner. And uh, just has... A Velstrak that follows him around and helps him out, so... So he permanently has the box solved. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, what the adventure is completely colored by ZK because... Um, obviously... Queen Iliosa puts mm-hmm. on... Kazavon's artifact, her mind becomes corrupted by Kazavon, basically, um, and is, you know, sp- gonna spell doom for Corvosa, um, and the party <laughs> essentially needs to stop her and also kind of stop Kazavon from coming back. Yeah. Like, it's like kind of like <laughs> the final, like, thesis of it. It's like you're stopping her, you're stopping all these people from dying, and you're also stopping, like, him from. You know, she's, making a she's play kind of being she's kind put of his together. avatar. Yeah, she's kind of his avatar, you know. At least that's the way I've always played it. Is that like she is him on on land. She's like his She's like the manifestation of his personality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is what yeah. like starts to happen. And and you know, she certainly gets like some of his power too. You see that in uh, I believe it's book three when she takes like a crossbow bolt to the temple and just like shrugs it shrugs off. Shrugs it off and then murders the guy that yeah. did it. Yep. <laughs> um, but it's very interesting because Kazavon as a character, you know, he he's not the BBEG technically. Um, you don't fight him, but like he is stabbed out in in the book. And there is a world where, you know, he has these, like, seven parts that were taken apart that are always, like, trying to get back together uh, that could reform him. So, like, his fangs are the crown. And, like, his wings are, like, around some throne in the shackles buried deep uh, in in an island or something. Like, his skull, I believe, is, like somewhere in the realm of the mammoth lords so he's he's like this essentially planar ally of Kaz, or of Zani K is has been destroyed but is like a CR25 elder uh, elder worm blue dragon that when put together uh, you know really sucks for the party has is Kazavon a Dracolich? No, just a uh, no, uh, he's... blue dragon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just, he's not statted as a Dracolich. A... Although, I am kind of surprised he... I can't remember if he's statted with... It's a disassembled blue dragon. Um, like, cleric levels or anything? Like, I think he just Let worships Kazavon. I don't think he, like, gets divine power from him. I'm not sure about that. I'd have Has to anybody stats. read um, Shadows at Sundown? I've read the pseudo, part of it. The pseudo sequel. I haven't read it. Uh, yeah, I haven't read it either. I didn't know if that if that played into any. That of... one has to do with there's like there's some sort of vampiric uh, group like trying to do something under the yeah under the Grand It's Mastaba. not Kazavon related. It's okay. Uh, uh, Kazavon is a male advanced great worm. Blue Dragon Fighter Eldritch Knight. There you go. Uh, fighter cool. 1 Eldritch Knight for CR 25. That one level of fighter that puts him over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even get bravery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I um when I when I first pitched this adventure to my to my group, um, it was either that or Rise of, uh, Rise of the Rune Lords and or like, oh yeah, shit. Let's play an urban adventure. Um, and we were we were all in, all into it. And then when we get to book four, it's like 
Well, we're not doing an urban adventure anymore. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> I was uh, like, oh, what the shit is this? Yeah. yeah Book, Book 4 needs yeah. some tweaking. Book 4 is a little, uh, you know. I, I do like just, that the anniversary kind of a... edition brings you back into Corvosa for the end of the book. That's yeah. good. It doesn't really solve the, like, noble savage bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, that no, is kind not of. Not at all. Yeah, the whole first part of it, though. Right. But, um, I. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's other adventures that I've. It, it's funny, like in, in Carrying Crown, the um, the Umbral Leaves is one of the books that, like, um, Professor Lorimore, the guy whose funeral you're there for, like, has in his stash of stuff that he's like borrowed and he's been researching. So it's like it's like that and Serving Your Hunger, the Ergothoa book that he has. Mm-hmm. So everybody's kind of like, oh, nice. What's he doing looking up these gods? Um, I think, so I played Return of the Rune Lords, um, and, you know, slight spoilers for that, uh, which I'll be through in like a minute or two. But um, you do go to the Shadow Plane for for a good portion of that, um, and you, like, you go to Incariax's plane, not uh, not Zonkathon's. So Incariax is one of those chitin demagogues that we talked about. Huh. And so you get to see at least like kind of the flavor of like what being next to uh, Zani K's deific realm is is like, and you get to see like what a demagogue is like. And there's a nice. lot of there's a lot of like chitin en- enemies, so it's. I guess in theme very similar, but you don't do anything with Zonkathon specifically. Yeah, I don't think I've ever I've played anything else where ZK had a big a major role. Yeah, Nothing that I can uh, think of. I'm not seeing a lot in like doing a quick uh, word search in my uh in my adventure paths folder, uh, comes up a, quite a bit in the uh, the Hell's Rebels and Hell's Vengeance, which kind of makes sense because of the relationship Nidal has with Cheliax. Um, mm-hmm. Comes up quite a bit in Giant Slayer, I guess. Yeah, I was the um, the oh, I, I didn't know, but I didn't know that about Giant Slayer. At least, at least when I listen to GCP, it, it, uh, up to the point that I stopped listening, I don't think I ever remember them listen, talking about Zamkutan. It's probably some of the, like, giant priests or something. Yeah, probably. I know um, that when I, was, when I was working on converting Way of the Wicked, um, the third-party evil adventure path... It was going to be heavily Zonkuthan. Yeah, I know um, that one's like specifically the Asmodian thing, yeah, right? It was it was it was Asmodius and Zonkuthan was going to be the two big ones that were going to be a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, Asmodius is the is the primary one. Uh, I haven't yeah, read was, this module, but uh, apparently there is a. A Zonkuthan themed module from first edition, uh, the Midnight Mirror. Yep, that uh, one. is set in Nidal. Um, so I'm sure he takes up a good chunk of space in that module, but I've not read it, so I can't give you any spoilers, unfortunately. I've not either. Well, all right, we're about the two hour mark. Anything else? I think mark? that's all I've got. I've always wanted to make a monk of Zankuthan in first edition, at least that had the um, it was the monk archetype that could use a spike chain. <laughs> I've always wanted to do it, never got a chance. I have a swashbuckler, swashbuckler <laughs> anti paladin of Zankuthan in my uh, Tyrant's Grasp game. I should have gave a warning to that for someone to do earmuffs, but I'm pretty sure he already knows what this character uh, is, which is very fun to play a uh, another vampire in air quotes 
uh, worshiper of Zankuzan. I had a uh, a serial killer vigilante. Oh yeah, you, I remember you telling me Zankuzan, about this. Of Zankuzan, uh, bleatling gnome in Corvosa. Uh, that that met an unfortunate end in a TPK when we ran through house <laughs> on Hook Street. My uh, my inquisitor that I took to twenty in Return of the Rune Lords uh, was a inquisitor of the black butterfly that defected from the um, the Umbral Court. His he was a vampire and his mom was a vampire on the Umbral Court, so he worked for the Umbral Court for a while. That was like his backstory because he came in at like level five. Nice, very cool. Well, all right, folks, that's it.